I've always had a passion for being around and learning about animals. When I was younger, going to zoos and animal parks was always a part of my life. I wanted to share my passion with family and friends, so I started working with people that loved animals as much as I did, and my YouTube channel was born. Today we are at the Powder Valley Nature Center, and we are going to talk with some people about hummingbird banding, and I hope you guys enjoy the video. So today we're here with Lanny, and we're doing hummingbird banding, is that correct? Yes. So, first off, how do you catch a hummingbird exactly? Well, we use traps, and there are several different kinds of traps, and it's usually a good idea to deploy more than one type, because some birds will go into one and not into the other. Uh, trap isn't something they encounter every day, so naturally when they see some weird thing surrounding the feeder that they've been feeding at for a while, they're a little bit cautious, but some of them will go in, as you've been seeing. Uh, then we fetch them out of the trap, just barehanded, which is probably the hardest part to learn, is how to catch them without hurting them. That requires a bit of training and some study on their anatomy. And and probably a lot of patience as well. Lots of patience. Um, patience is our major tool with hummingbirds. They don't have any because they have to eat too often. We can go for hours without eating. They can't. So we can always outweigh them. Eventually the bird in there will get its wings in a position where it's safe to close your hand around it uh, without bending anything the wrong way. Then you, we take it out of the trap, we usually put it in a little mesh bag for carrying because there's nothing more embarrassing than having a bird escape before you have a chance to put it in. <laughs> Happens to everybody, but we try to minimize that. And they're safe inside the bag and the restriction on their wing flapping generally makes them give up and they settle down a bit, which makes it much easier to handle. Take them out of the bag, we, well, We'll get a band ready. Uh, when you take the bird out of the mesh bag, the first thing you have to do is determine its, its sex uh, so you can tell what band, size band to put on it. Female ribby throats, the hummingbirds we have here, are just a little bit bigger than males. And they're enough bigger that a band that will fit a male hummingbird uh, be small enough not to fall off of its its foot uh, is too small for a female and could constrict her leg and injure her. And conversely, a female band tends to fall off of a male's foot. And we're talking the circumference of the band. Of the band, the difference is 0 0.2 millimeters. Wow! But on a hummingbird scale, that's quite a bit. That's like this much <laughs> to a hummingbird. So we need to determine the sex accurately because we want that band to stay on the bird the rest of the bird's life. The whole point of banding a bird is if it's caught later, we learn something about, well, we learn how old they are by catching them over and over until we don't catch them anymore. Um, and hopefully someone else will catch these birds and we'll learn something about their migration patterns and uh, their travels. So, I saw that the bands are extremely tiny they for their are. really small legs. So, do the bands interfere with their flying or lifestyle at all? The, w I don't know anybody who's ever seen a hummingbird pay any attention whatsoever to its band. Unlike hawks and some other birds, they don't try and get them off, they just ignore them. The band weighs about a milligram um, versus the average weight of a ruby throat is about three grams. So if you do the math, it's less than a wristwatch is to a human. So I did a video on bird banding before where they, they were songbirds and they were using a big mesh net. Mm -hmm. And you say you use traps, so why do you use traps rather than the mesh nets? Okay, to, first of all, a standard songbird net, the mesh is so big that hummingbirds, if they can't fly through them, they easily can get work their way through them. And also hummingbirds, the scale of their life is different because they're so small. And they, they don't fly very fast. They fly about 25 miles an hour. And they see the nets and they just go right over them. Um, there are nets for hummingbirds that have a very small mesh and very fine nylon, uh, but they're, they don't work very well. 
the catching birds. Traps are more efficient. And they tend to get tangled up in them, and they're very difficult to remove when they get their the monofilament wrapped around their wings and their heads. Probably just a giant pain in the butt. It is. It is. It's it's a nightmare. I don't own a mist net. I don't. I'm trained in using them. I, I don't want to have anything to do with them. I just don't like them. I don't need them. Traps nope. work better. As we've seen this morning, the traps are working great. Yeah. And like fine. my traps, like as you guys probably see in the corner of the video. They're not harming them in any way. They fly in, and then they're just you know, just picked up. Yeah. So how long have you been banding hummingbirds? I started training in 1998. So I got my my master permit in 2001, I think. So that's been about 20, 20 years. So you're quite experienced in this. I've yeah. I've, well, I don't band as many as some, but I've banded over 5,000 hummingbirds. Wow. So, what are we finding out by banding these humming hummingbirds? First, as I mentioned, uh, obviously we learn how long they live by banning them, especially if we ban them as youngsters, like so far all these have been. Um, we keep, if we keep catching them year after year until we don't catch them anymore, we've got to a handle on their lifespan. And the average for a ruby throated is about four years. I think the females probably live a little longer than the males do. Um, <clears throat> but equally as interesting, if they're caught by another bander away from where they're originally banded, we learn something about their travels. And what kind of terrain can you find the ruby throat hummingbirds in? Because that's what we're looking for today. Well, this is pretty much ideal a hardwood forest, but the range of the ruby throat is so big, they breed from the Gulf Coast to, we think, the northern edge of the boreal forest in Canada. That's where the trees give out and it just turns into tundra. If there's trees, you'll find ruby throats. So you're talking about them being in your garden, and for other people, how would you attract them to your yard? Uh, a garden full of hummingbird favored plants is a really excellent way, because they're no maintenance once you get them in. Just about any kind of salvias are good. Um, coral honeysuckle, a native honeysuckle, uh, it grows in, it's native to south. Southeastern Missouri that grows everywhere. That's an excellent plant. Trumpet creeper is also native all over the state, but you don't want to plant it too close to your house because it gets to be kind of invasive when it doesn't have competition. Um, and of course, you can always get a hummingbird feeder. Um, and in the hummingbird feeder, you make a sugar solution of one part sugar to four parts water, nothing else. You don't have to boil it, just stir it till it dissolves and you're good to go. That's pretty easy. I would like to thank Lanny and the Powder Valley Nature Center for allowing me to come out here and do the video today. And as always, I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. Don't forget to leave a big thumbs up down below, subscribe to my channel, and also check out my Instagram, at Cole Shirk. And as always, I'll see you next week.